Good morning. I'm Dr. Laura Shackelford. Welcome to The Higher View. And today's guest that I have, I'm so ex excited, is my, I call him my third son, Daniel Neymod. He's a singer, songwriter, producer, and just a wonderful human being. Good morning, Daniel. So good to see you. Thank you. Are you trying to get me to blush just when we start? Yeah. Yes. No, no, it's just the truth. You know, I always say that whenever I see you. I told you that if your parents didn't want you, I'd adopt you. <laughs> you're, you're, you're just so just so special. I remember the first time I saw you was at a Silomar, and that had to be, oh my God, I want to say 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. It had to yep. be um, before about 2004, 2005 would have been most likely at, at right. the latest. Yeah. Right, right. So, so Dan, so those of you who have been to our center, of course, Daniel's been to Center for Spiritual Living Palm Desert several times. He's, he, he travels all over. He, but you weren't, you didn't start out as a musician. I mean, that no. wasn't your original career. No, in fact, uh, not only did I not start out as a music musician, but I didn't even consider a career in music uh, until my 20s. I mean, when I was applying for college, even though I was poster child for music school of some kind, not, not like a classical music school where I'm in a practice room you know, 10 hours a day, but definitely like uh, there are, there are schools that have pop, pop music and songwriting and r music production and perf all those kinds of things. Uh, and I was, I mean, I was just perfect for those schools and it was on nobody's radar in my family. My parents are attorneys. My dad is a professor of law and professional career was, was the agenda for all three name odd boys. So when I finished college, I went, when I went to college, uh, I majored in economics in college, and in fact, the other school that I really seriously considered, the other two schools were University of Chicago, a super cerebral place, intellectual place, and uh, University of Illinois in their engineering school, and to this day, I don't have any idea what that means, engineering school, even though I would have loved to be an architect as a kid, but, so I don't know what I was doing applying to engineering school. I know why I majored in economics because I thought economics was super interesting when I took a first couple of classes. Um, graduated with a degree of econ in economics, and I had been follow me here because this is all free. You know, this is all the mess inside my head. But I, I'd also been programming computers for fun since I was a boy. Oh uh, my since, god! Yeah, since the original TRS-80 and Commodore 64 and the original Atari computer and the original Apple Apple II computer. Um, so I needed a job that felt professional of some kind. I wasn't going to go to law school, even though my parents probably would still send me to law school if I, if I would go. Um, so I became a computer programmer after college because I had gotten good at it over the years. Uh, not great, uh, but good. And I, it was, mo it was mostly, I enjoyed the logical process of code of programming. Um, I enjoyed the, it's a very interesting, thoughtful, um, mathematical experience to program something. And I, so I did that for six years after college. And only in the middle of that decade, this is my 20s, did I really uh, start, like I, I inherited a little bit of money from my, from my Bubby and Zadie, my mom's parents who had died. Um, they had died uh, a few years earlier. And I received that money when I graduated college and I used some of it to buy some basic recording equipment. And my parents got me a digital piano for a graduation gift. So you were already doing music then. I mean, you well, had to have had an interest or you wouldn't have wanted to get that. I, mean, I wouldn't why? call it an interest. It, it wasn't an interest. It, it was, it was a, uh, it was a, it's a 24 hour a day. Um, I, it's not like, it's not like, I, I don't need to say it, but I'll just say it anyway. It's not like you're talking to a Mozart, you know, who was composing as a little boy, right? Granted, okay. granted, I wasn't Mozart, right. but, 
but within the confines of just within the within kind of a, a normal range of, of natural talent and uh, and interest, I was way on the high end of of the normal range, such that I could play when I was seven or eight. I used to show off, you know, that I could play whatever song I heard on the radio. Uh, wow. By, well, a little bit, not like again, not not like a genius, but I always had a, a strong ear. Even as a little boy, I was making up harmonies. Uh, in high school, I was writing songs. They weren't any good, but it was all, you know, it was all, it was always stirring. Only, only really in my 30s and 40s did I realize that music never actually stops going in my mind. Um, never. In my dreams, there's songs. When there's music playing anywhere within range, I'm analyzing it, thinking about the chords that are happening, the melody, the choices they're making. Now that I've learned how to produce records, I even, I have more more questions that I ask of myself and more analysis, you know, you know what I mean? The analysis gets more complex over the years, but I was always a musician and it always made me ridiculously happy. It just mm -hmm. wasn't on the radar to do it for a job. Right, for right. Right. Okay, so okay. I sound funny. I sound funny. Yeah, it's okay. Um, so, well, so did, you said you could play. Did you take piano lessons, or did you just learn on your own? I took a few years of piano lessons. My parents insisted on piano lessons for all three boys. Um, I think there was some cutoff. It might have been eighth grade was the natural was the cutoff when when we had to when we there was a cutoff for when we could quit if we wanted to. I was the only one who didn't quit. The, to be honest though, the problem with Danny has always been discipline to practice. So even though I ate that stuff, in fact, I mean, I ate it up, but I didn't work hard enough to get great at an instrument. Um, I just didn't, I just didn't. I, I, my parents, uh, I, my mom still remembers talking to the teacher um, that I had in sixth, seventh, eighth grade, maybe freshman in high school, and telling her, you have to stop playing for him the little piece that you're assigning him to learn because he's learning it more or less by ear and cheating his way, you know, rather than sitting down and practicing and, right, and working it out note by note, I would cheat a bit, you know? So it's not that I'm a lazy person, but concentrating on practice is a certain kind of animal. There are <laughs> there are people who can do it. And and you know what, I mean, like my dad could could have done it, could have done that because that's the way he did his, his law work. My dad was always at a desk, concentrating, solitary, that was never my specialty. But yes, I took piano lessons as a boy. Um, I quit I quit because I didn't practice and it was clear to everybody I was wasting the money and the time. And uh, since then, I mean, I took a handful of voice lessons after college, I vaguely remember. I took a handful of guitar lessons when I first tried to learn guitar. And the rest is very, very slowly self-taught. Wow, wow. You know, all of it, the songwriting, the perform, everything. I mean, and and if I have a regret, I mean, you know, who, who doesn't and maybe who does, I mean, th given that there's no point, if I had a regret, it would be how quickly I could have absorbed um, so much material had I gone to one of those music schools that focused on these things that I've now learned from experience. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't say the hard way, it's been fun, but the slow way for sure, you know. Oh, wow. uh, yeah. So when did you make the switch? I was 28. Uh, 1990, December 4th, 1997 was the day I was taking a class on computer programming uh, that I didn't want to take in a job I didn't want to have. And the whole, uh, and I was engaged to be married and I deep down knew I shouldn't be getting married. Mm -hmm. And I was in this entire career path that I knew I didn't really want. And the inauthenticities piled on top of each other. And I broke that day. In other words, I just, uh, the dam broke. And what essentially happened was I suddenly realized why I was freaking out, why I was miserable, why I was so anxious. And that was because I was keeping 
not to be melodramatic, but you know, I was I was holding the truth at bay right. with everything I had. And with me, for me, holding the truth at bay means overeating, getting cranky. You know, I mean, it shows up. Right. right? However, it's going to show up that kind of inauthenticity, one way or another, in, in an addiction. It's going to show up in something. For me, it showed up with being. I'm now. I'm now. I'm chubby, but I blame my son. But <laughs> but then I didn't have I blame COVID. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Have, right, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, but I didn't have anybody to blame. It was just. It was just. It was just anxiety and and you know inauthenticity seems like a cerebral word, but really lying every day to myself, pretending to be enthusiastic, pretending to care at the job, planning a wedding when I you know have you I. Should I ask you, have you ever planned a wedding that you knew you shouldn't be having? No. Because it's not, it's not pleasant because you, you, you end up faking excitement. You know what I mean? And there's, cause you, it really is a process that ought to not, it, it shouldn't tax you. It should actually be, you know what I mean? So all those processes was all, were all fatiguing instead of exciting. Everything about everything about the whole life I was living, and it all collapsed on that day. And eight, uh, nine, ten months later, I was in L.A. Uh, I told my fiance the next day that I needed to be single when I when I had that realization, and uh, and I saved quitting the job for a few months because uh, I had recently read a list in the newspaper of the biggest stressors in life. Mm -hmm. uh, have you, yeah, it was like bankruptcy, death in the family, you know, relocating, new job, <laughs> right? It was all these things. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm now, I'm confronted with like four of the top 10 stressors all at once. If I can actually delay one of them, that seems like a smart thing to do. So I took a breath for a few months. I'm not jealous. I'm not jealous of my boss during those few months because I was barely there, of course. Um, you know, I sort of phoned it in until until I got a little clarity and a little calm inside. And then I realized, OK, it's music. Now let's see how that looks. And I got in my car uh, September of the next year, 98, and drove to L.A. And uh, a Silomar, uh happened right away next next summer. It happened. Wow. Uh, and I did that five, six years straight. Uh, and that's where I met you and where I met Joe and met a lot of people. Um, and uh, among other things, that that gig actually, the Silmar Conference. For those of you who don't know, that's a conference. I don't know if it still happens or if it's been resurrected it, in any way. It, it's not it's, a Silmar anymore. They still do have something, but it's nothing yeah. like a Silmar. Yeah, yeah. So I came out on a stage those that first summer, played a couple songs. Uh, you know, I could you know, the details aren't that interesting, but basically what happened is people from around the country uh, liked what they heard and they sensed correctly that I was sincere about what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, that I liked I liked making the world a better place with a song. I liked making a room happy. Uh, I wasn't um, that I had some some good musical you know foundation for what I was doing. Uh, you know, it's just sincere, sincere and passionate. And right. it, there's yeah, a it question really, here. Do you see this? Do you feel you are a musician incarnate? And I think well. you are. I think you definitely are. Yeah. There was something in your soul that yeah. needed to come out that yeah. you, that you knew. And and thank God you followed it. Was it now with your parents being so professional and so, yeah. that must have been difficult for you, or was it? Well, uh, it's it's a uh, there's it was difficult. Um, you know what? I can't call it difficult. They 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 paid for the piano lessons when I started high. They they actually did something. It's their fault. <laughs> they they that that's correct. They actually did something that really went outside their comfort zone. This is going to sound extreme, unless somebody watching uh, grew up in any traditional religion. Okay, we grew up in a traditional Jewish home. My father, my for my father and mother, Judaism was and is an a rock solid pillar of their lives. Oh. Um, my my uh, my mother's parents survived the Holocaust barely. Oh, wow. Everyone in their family died from for being Jewish. My father grew up in a tough neighborhood in Chicago, and 
his academic ability, his smarts, uh, and a Jewish high school uh, that he went to, you know, saved his life in a very in a very real way. Judaism figured very heavily and important in my family, right? Mm -hmm. My older brother, three years older, went to the same high school my father went to. That's how tight wow. this was. My younger brother never hesitated, never questioned whether he was going to go to that high school. Danny was <laughs> interested was interested in two things that the Jewish high school had none of. It had no computers and it had no music, no music program of any kind, right? Tiny high school, low budget. And we grew up in Skokie and I grew up in Skokie and Niles North High School at the time, and I'm pretty sure still to this day, had two concert bands, two orchestras, three choirs, and a musical theater program. It's not the richest school district in the world, but it is far from the poorest. And it, and the, the music program was fantastic. And my parents looked at their son and looked at Niles North and looked at the uh, Jewish high school and they sent me to the public high school. And wow. it, was not, it was not a comfortable decision for them. Um, uh, and to be yeah. honest, and I was never really a part I was never all in on the in into the fold into the I was never the un I don't mean I I don't know how to say this without sounding um without sounding a little snarky okay I was never the guy who did exactly what he was told in the religion in which he was raised and didn't question the logic the logic of it or the kindness of it that was never me I was the guy who would secretly change the language of a blessing. If it was a blessing to bless the state, the people of Israel, I would change it to the people of the world. Oh. Now I would, do, I would do that to myself that you're not allowed to do that. I mean, it's, you know, imagine in Catholicism, it's the same thing. You no. don't change the words to the prayers. No. Never mind that the prayers were written by people. <laughs> I don't mean to start. I don't you know, understand I mean, that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So like, I was. Always, I was. Always, always, that, right. <laughs> right. Right. So, so for me, going to a public high school was actually, you know, you want to talk about incarnate or like meant to be. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, you know, my song "One Power" and yeah. I, have a lot, I have a lot of songs that say similar things. Incarnate, like born to be a musician. Yes and born to not be in a small group at the exclusion of the larger, both definitely true. And it broke my parents' heart that I wanted to go to a public high school. Um, you know, I I'm, I'm, didn't marry a Jewish girl. Um, I'm not religious at all. And uh, so I have been a, uh, I've been a weirdo and an outlier in my family you know, for a long, long time. I'm also, by the way, more sentimental and more liberal and, you know, more emotional in general. And the things that I pour out through my songs, these are feelings that nobody else in my family admits to. But even if but, the values, even if the values are the same, they don't admit to the feelings even. I am a weirdo, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. But so, but does 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 your music touch their hearts though? Do they do they feel it, or they, that's just they're more in their head more than their heart? I mean, I I can't imagine your music not touching their hearts. You, um, I'm sure it does. They admit to it sometimes. You know, um, two answers. One is one is my mom loves last song, right? It, if this is my last song, if this is my final day, right? That song, I know that she loves. And I also know that they love, they love that I sing. And they, they especially love uh, some of the uh, situations in which I sing. For example, even in high school, I would visit uh, that Bubby I already mentioned in the hospital. She, came, she had breast cancer. And I would visit, and I would visit my dad's uh, mom in nursing homes. And I never visited a nursing home without sitting at the piano and entertaining the people, either in the common room or the common area. Or I, I would do formal concerts. I would tell them I was coming. Um, 
that always made them deeply proud. And they would always come when I would visit my dad's mom in the nursing home she lived in for a decade before she died. She died in 98. Uh, it was Danny's coming to town. Let's have a concert. In fact, I think my dad would even set them up. He would call the you know activities director and say, wheel out the grand piano. Danny's coming back. And I would sing Johnny Mathis and oh. Irving Lynn and Cole Porter uh, and entertain them. That was always me, my always me. So that part makes them very, very proud because my parents are very generous and charitable people, but sentimental, no, no, no. Mm. So, so do they want, so do they hear a song like, uh, you know, uh, if I was blind, blind for a day, where would I go if my heart had its way? You wouldn't say, my heart says, in the name on family, there's no my heart. You know, that's not, that's not. That's just not. That's not where we. That's not where I come from. Right. Um, it just isn't. You know. Wow. They love their. They love their boys. They never never spent a day thinking about anything other than their boys, as far as I can tell, our right. entire lives. But they're not that way. My music is much much softer, and much more emotional, um, than than it has a right to be based on where I came from. You know, wow. I can't, I can't explain it. No. Well, and I, I do believe like the person that wrote that, that that was something in your soul. You came here to do this. This was, you would have, you would have lived a miserable life if you would have tried to, to, to stay in that box that your parents expected you or that you were taught was the right way. And, and you wouldn't have the life the family that you that you have and i want to jump to your wife because that was an interesting story talk about fate huh fate guiding us spirit guiding us to the right place at the right time i yeah. love the story the story of how i met melina mm -hmm. yeah yeah um you know what it was uh the the as you know the context of the decision that led to meeting Melina, the context of it is that I had just been back from three months of a sabbatical in Utah, where I wrote, uh, if this is my last song, where I wrote, I want to be like water coming down a mountain, mm -hmm. and where I wrote, uh, I'll just go where the ocean says to go, right? Where I wrote songs about um, or what do I do if I'm not chasing anything? What do I do if I've got everything that I need? It's a question that no one's prepared me to answer. Right? What if the race is over and we all automatically win? So a part of me was unwinding, um, unwinding a spring of ambition. Right? It was, it was, uh, it was resting inside in a way that it never had before. Um, and a part of an ambition, I, I think. You know, anybody watching who's going to relate one way or another, a part of one one ambition that most of us have is to meet a soulmate and get married and live happily ever after. For most, I won't say I won't include having kids because that's not actually everybody's vision. In fact, it was never even necessarily my own vision. Um, but certainly, certainly every time you go on a first date, you wonder, is this the one? There's a there's a the one concept, right? Capital T, capital O. <laughs> Is this the one? And you wonder, right? You wonder from high school on. You want, you think, I think, I think most people think, you know, I love him. You know, uh, wow, well, I wonder, you know, is this the one? Is this going to last forever? You're always wondering. It's never a date for a date's sake. Not really. It's a, there's, an ambi there's an inherent ambition. It's actually a little bit like show business. There is no, <laughs> there is no, there is no moment in, in, um, in like a professional actor's life. Or a or professional singer's life, where you, where it is a moment that is unto itself enough, right? Mm -hmm. In the in the climbing and in the aspiration, you're always thinking, where is this going to lead? Always can it, or will there be another one? You win a Grammy, I bet, I bet, everyone who wins their first Grammy is wondering, is there going to be a second? How do right. I get? second a hit song how do i get another one a million dollars i can't wait for the second million there's always a next rung on the ladder uh and in dating it's hard to view a date as just a nice time 
Right. Right. And I had been, I mean, I wasn't a, I wasn't a crazy dater. I, I, uh, oh, but I remember Silomar women were after you, but you were always kind of aloof. I know. I mean, you, you, you weren't at least what I saw. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, this one because you're a minister, right? You're on stage. So yeah. you know that there's a, there's a specific relationship that a person on stage has with people who are off stage mm -hmm. and it's not immediate. It, it, the first moment of that relationship is not an equals relationship because you just got off of stage. Mm -hmm. So uh, aloof maybe, but for sure I was always like, you know, I'm not, I'm not walking around this inspirational conference singing spiritual songs to hook up with, with groupies. In fact, really? I don't even know what groupies are and I would never even use the word hook up. That's how fast that thought is to me. Uh, so yes, I was always a little, a little guarded about that because I don't, yeah. I didn't want to, you know, cause I'm not, uh, I'm not pretend. I don't, it sounds, it sounds like a boast. Maybe it doesn't sound like a boast if you're not a clean cut, you know, kind of clean living person. And then it sounds lame. But if you are a clean living person, then you'll know what I mean when I say I really am actually kind of like I appear. I mean, I, I, you are. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I've never had a beer. I've never had a cup of coffee. Really? I like I like sugar and I'm not secret about it. You know, I, I mean, I have pretty simple tastes. And when I'm nice to somebody, I mean it. And when I. You know what I'm saying? Like when, and when I sing a song about being nice, I mean it. I um, so, so, so my, I mean, not to sound heroic. I mean, it's just, it's just, I'm not, it's not, this is not an act. Right. You know? Right. Um, no, no. Well, yeah. About you, Daniel, Daniel. Yeah. Thank you. So, so uh, I forgot what we were talking about. Oh yeah. So meeting Melina. You're right. Yeah. So you just writing all that music. Right. So, I was feeling that vibe of going where the ocean says to go. And I was trying to, I was surrendering very consciously, really, even the notion that I was going to meet the one, you know, I was 36, right? Not super young anymore for meeting the one. I mean, you know, it starts, starts sounding like a higher number, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my parents got married, I think 25 and 23 or something. And they were dating since they were teenagers. Wow. Um, so, uh, but I consciously let go of, I tried to let go of the ambition behind a lot of the things, you know, do you write a song to, for it to be a hit or do you write a song because you need to, right. right? Do you, do you go on a date because you want to spend a couple hours with the person or do you go on a date out of this long-term longing for meeting the one? They're very, it's a very different vibe. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, so I had let that all go as best I could. Uh, and I got a call, I got a call for Christmas time. Um, somebody said, left a message saying, I'm sure Daniel doesn't sing at weddings, but I, does he have any wedding songs? Because I'd like to play one of his, I want to, I want to walk down the aisle to his song, get ready my soul. And if he has any wedding song, I will play that also at our wedding. Now I had chosen to stay home. Uh, in LA, home, so to speak, because in a very rare occasion, my older brother Jack was coming in from New York and my parents were coming in from Chicago and the whole family was going to be together. And I had just gotten an invitation. I think, I've, I assume I've told you this part. I have a very cool friend, oh, yeah. a wonderful friend who's also very cool and he gets very cool invitations. And he got an invitation to float on a billionaire's yacht to the Bahamas over the holidays, and he invited me to go with him. And as he probably put it at the time, beautiful girls galore, right? <laughs> and my family was coming into town, and I had recently realized that I just wasn't feeling connected to my family enough. And I thought to myself, I could go on this boat, but if I say I wanna spend more time with my family, they're all coming to LA, so I mean, I either want more family time or I don't. So I turned down the boat. I stayed in town. Then I got this phone call about this wedding. And I thought, well, it's a few hours. I'm in town. So I, so I, so I said to Sarah, who does my booking, I said, tell them they'll sing at their wedding. Oh, my God. <laughs> she, probably, oh. <laughs> she couldn't believe it. And neither could Sarah. She mm -hmm. said, why, why the hell would you do that? You know, uh. 
uh, I said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I just, it's just a, a gut feeling. So, so wow. in that mind frame of, you know, going where the ocean says to go, I just felt a yes instead of a no. And the day before, and the day of actually, Sarah said, tell me again why you're driving three hours uh, to sing three songs for strangers for a couple hundred dollars that you don't need. Uh, Cause I, I didn't need it. I mean, I, it's always helpful, but I didn't need it at the time. Uh, and I said, I don't know. I'll tell you when I get there. And I'll tell, I'll tell you after. So I went, I sang my three songs at the wedding in the backyard of a house in Joshua Tree, the town. And I went to the back room to pack up my guitar afterwards and in walks a girl with a plate of strawberries. And I said, what are you doing back here? Aren't you the sister of the bride? And she said, yeah, my whole family's out there, but I, I prefer just a quiet room. And I said, I said, yeah, me too. I said, to be honest, like a, a wild date for me is like Scrabble or something. And she looked at me. I brought Scrabble to the wedding. <laughs> and uh, we didn't play Scrabble that day, although I did meet my future dog because oh. Maggie, Maggie the dog was there with Melina. And uh, six days later, I was at Melina's house with her and her uh, best friend. Uh, and we played Scrabble for two or three hours. And on my way home, back up to LA, Melina called me and we talked until two or three in the morning. And we had basically. I've uh, been uh, inseparable ever since. So I met my wife simply by saying yes to something that made no sense. Ugh. That's the story. That's kind of the story of your life, really. I mean, and it, <laughs> yeah. I mean, right? Right? Yeah. A right? lot of no sense. Yeah. Yeah. And so how long were you married before Jude came along? Uh, well, I sound like a jerk if I say not long enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um two years uh -huh. okay but of course we were we were uh, 39 and 37 when we uh got married mm -hmm. so we're not uh you know we're not movie stars with beverly hills uh implantation doctors or whatever the hell they do these days you know there there comes an age when pregnancy gets harder and riskier and by the way we actually weren't we really and melina by the way Loved the Tao of Pooh before we met. Um, had already. Had, she's she's like a, she's one of those people who is a master of certain things that the rest of us take workshops for and still can't figure out. Right. You know? And one of them was that notion of going where the ocean says to go, of not forcing something to be. So right. we were both we both had that mindset about having a kid. We just we just thought if we do that's a good life. And if we don't, this is a good life. Right. That was the feeling about it. Well, and Jude was not going to be denied. <laughs> he was not going to be denied. Him and his opinions and his thick head of black hair when he was born were not going to be denied. That's correct. Right, right. Yeah. I don't know. I think there's something nice about having them older. I was in my mid-30s and late 30s when I had my boys. And I think you're more prepared for it. If you can ever be prepared for it, less I don't energy, know. Ever, did you, huh? didn't, didn't you worry about? Did you feel like you had less energy to just run after them? Oh, yeah. yeah. But you know what? My my kids are younger. My Corey and Tiffany are younger, and they still don't. Even, you know, they're they're early thirties. So yeah, okay. I don't know. I just you, nobody can prepare you. I don't think they they can tell you how much work it is, but nobody can prepare you for how difficult it is and yet how you wouldn't miss it for anything in the world you yes. know as exhausted as you are and as frustrated as you can get this is the best time this is you know i will because i didn't want kids i just happened to get pregnant we were married 13 years and i messed up on my pills thinking ah, i'd been on them for 13 years i'm not going to get pregnant well, i did <laughs> Right. <laughs> I, I, I'm saying if I ever write a book, it's going to be thank you, God, for being smarter than me, because if it had been up to me, I wouldn't have, you know, I wasn't going to abort, but I sure wasn't real thrilled. I, my attitude was, well, you know, they say it's great. You know, they love them. Right. I said, what are they going to say? They're stuck with them for 18 years. <laughs> right. I always thought that for sure. Right. Yeah. Right. Because it doesn't look it doesn't it doesn't look fun from the outside. Um, yeah. It looks exhausting and depleting, and it is exhausting and depleting. 
it is. Yeah, but we were struck right away by by the um, by the feeling of it that cannot be explained. You know what I mean? Like the feeling you simply don't know. Like all the times I had walked through, let's say, an airport before then, and <laughs> seen somebody holding their baby. Nobody tells you that holding your baby is one of the oh. loveliest feelings in the world. Now, of course, then also nobody tells you that the sound of your baby screaming at you yes. is one of the most horrifying. <laughs> yes. Right. And enraging. I mean, just upsetting oh. feelings. Right. So that, like there's parts you just really can't communicate. In fact, you know, another thing it made us, it made us um, much more, uh, much more empathetic. We'd never, we'd never quite understood we never understood people who were desperate to have babies, who had, uh, who, yeah. who you know, made expensive procedures to have babies, who tried, quote unquote, for years to have babies and were heartbroken when they couldn't and so on. As soon as we met Jude and felt what it felt like, that broke open uh, a lot of sympathy and compassion for people who had always, because, because what, what 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 it turned out to us was that they had always known something we hadn't known. They'd exactly. known how it was going to feel. I had no clue. I mean, I had no clue until the moment they put Ryan in my arms and I burst out crying. And that's right. when I said, thank you, God, for being smarter than me, because I would have missed this. I would have missed this and would never want. I don't regret a moment of my life, you know, yeah. that yeah. I because my I remember when I got pregnant, my mom said, she goes, well, L Laura, she said, wouldn't you have missed this? And I said, how would I miss something I never even knew? I mean, right. I, I would have been fine, too, I think, if I would have not had any because I didn't know any better. Like you said, you don't right. know. You Which don't know the depth it's of good to not, It's good to not know. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. It, it, it really, really is. So you guys got married. So, so what's going on with you now? I mean, with COVID, I mean, all your gigs and, and so I know you're doing a lot of online stuff, aren't you? Yes. Yes, I am. Uh, what's going on with um, COVID is uh, I, I have made, um, I consider myself a fairly intelligent person, but I have, I have, stumbled into a few of the dumbest career choices anybody could ever make. Like for example, getting out of the computer business at the dawn of the computer uh, takeover of the world. So, so just like I wouldn't have known what it was like to hold my baby, I will never know what it would be like to hold uh, a thousand shares of a startup Microsoft, uh, even though I probably could have ended up in a company like that. Uh, so let's not think about that. <laughs> On another subject, um, <laughs> then I entered the music business uh, right when right when CDs were peaking. And then following CDs came Napster and the online, you know, digital stolen music revolution, which yes. undermined sales and stripped stripped away that revenue. Uh, which I ignored, and then came, then came the the uh, social media revolution, which I ignored, and the you know the near death of physical media for music, you know, selling a CD, which I still prefer a CD to any of the rest. Mm -hmm. um, so I I have been front and center for a I got out of the computer business at the worst possible time and got into the music business at the worst possible time and have watched it decline. And then comes, oh, but, but by the way, this is not me complaining because you're looking at, I don't know if, I don't know, you know, neither one of us necessarily entirely, entirely believes in luck, but you and I both know there's, there is some just happenstance. Absolutely. In, you know, in a in a in a winning story, there's there's luck, and in a losing story, there's luck, mm -hmm. uh, right? Bad luck and good luck. You know, right. what I mean, there there is right out of there. all chaos, something good is trying to be born. Right. So for me, you know, you're looking at the luckiest independent singer songwriter. In uh, you know, I'm I mean, I'm probably 
if there are a hundred singer songwriters in America who have done better uh, as solo, unsigned, off the re- you know off the radar, independent artists, I don't think you could find a hundred in the United States. Wow. It's because because of people. I'm not. I mean, I mean it as a compliment, but not as flattery. Because of you, because of the people at Asilomar, because of the people at Unity Village, because of the people at Habitat for Humanity, because of people like my friend Nemo, because of people who responded to to my what was what has always been sincere generosity, right? They've responded with equal or greater generosity Mm -hmm. so that they have bought albums from an unknown guy simply because they were moved. They have sent gifts simply because they are moved and want to support it. Uh, You know what I mean? There it has been. So that so a whole stretch of time before this year was already built on the miracle and the good fortune of nice people saying yes to what I was and what I was doing and who I am, right? Or certainly how I make them feel, if if not who I am, but it's kind of the same in my case. It's not Mm -hmm. not a show business career that I have. Uh, This year uh, in March, I had a schedule, I had a schedule of travel through the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I had a very good January and February. I'm talking about money and performances. You know, I had conferences lined up. I had all kinds of things going. Uh, And then I came home from a gig in North Carolina and my phone started ringing and it was cancel, 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 cancel for the rest of the year. It started with the first next month or two and then cascaded forward until it was, well, obviously we're not doing that in October. You know, it was like that. Right. Right. So I could literally delete every entry in my calendar for the entire year. And Melina, who makes jewelry, as you know, her primary sales point of sales is my shows where I was putting out her jewelry with my music. And right. frankly, uh, it was a huge gift to her. And it was a huge gift to the family uh, because it was successful. I didn't sell 30 pieces of jewelry at a show, but I might sell two or three and her jewelry is sterling silver and semi-precious stones and not inexpensive. And it made a real difference and it built for her a part-time job while staying at home with Jude. So her job evaporated to zero and my job evaporated to zero in like three days. And we are not, (laughs) well, We are, neither one of us is a panicking person. Melina is more of a worrying person than I am. I have invented a living since that day in 1998 when I moved to LA. Inventing a living is what I do. I make up a song, I I I I create an event, I host retreats, I do work. That I, 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 I I go to work in those circumstances. That is, by the way, one of the gifts of the professional academic upbringing. My parents didn't raise artists. They raised law abiding, successful, not stars. They didn't raise superstars. That's not what we were supposed to be. They right. raised good, solid family, fathers, husbands. You know what I mean? Oh, that's so beautiful. That is right. that is beautiful though. So and, that you, is, and, and you get to be home. You're not having to travel as much, right? Right, right. So so there was a night, a uh, few nights after the schedule cleared in March. My wife always goes to sleep earlier than I do. I'm getting ready for bed. She looks up at me from the pillow and she says, Danny. I said, yes. What are we going to do? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Uh, you know, it was this was there was no stimulus payments. There was no unemployment. Um, we don't have a lot of money. Uh, and we just bought a new house too. We just bought a new house. We just bought a new house, which needed a new roof, new drain, new gutters, new floors, new ceilings, new walls, new plumbing, new. I mean, just everything. A fixer upper from hell. I mean, or it's a right. stream, but it's pretty, pretty, pretty intense. And she says, "Danny, what are we going to do?" And I said. I don't know, but I'm thinking about it. 
you know, and maybe the next day or the day after that, I had two clear thoughts. The first one was, if I can't bring in money, I am going to improve this home, which is, as you know, like, you know, essentially a retirement fund. I mean, we're in Orange County. You know, it's valuable. Long term, it's very valuable to own a home in Orange County. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to fix up this home myself. I'm going to do things that I never would have otherwise done because every thousand dollars of labor I put into it is saving us a thousand in cash and improving our net worth as a family. If I can't bring in money, I'm going to improve the net worth of the family through fixing up the home. And I went to work and I have not stopped. I'm physically stronger right now than I've literally ever been in my entire life. You really look good too. no, thank you. I'm also chubby, but <laughs> but I mean strong because I'm lifting right now. Right now, it's not quite a fixer upper part of the house, but I'm halfway done with building my son's Christmas present, which is a tree house. Oh. Uh, so yeah. I'm lifting two. They're two inch thick, ten inch wide. 12 or 14 foot long beams that, you know, they weigh 60, 70 pounds. It's a lot of weight. Uh I put in drywall. I broke up floor in the room I'm in right now. I put in the floor. I've put in insulation. I've installed a wood panel ceiling. I mean, I I poured concrete for the tree house. I never did. I never poured concrete before. It turns out the bags are freaking heavy. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I don't know. I don't know what people are thinking. The, I don't know if you have you ever have you ever moved a, a sheet of drywall? No, no, can't right. say that I have. Right, I hadn't either. But a sheet of drywall that's fire rated for like right. between, for a garage to the house, a sheet of drywall weighs seventy five pounds if it's a big big sheet, and it's eight. It's four feet wide and ten or twelve feet long. What the, what are you supposed to do with Did this? You do that by yourself? Did you do it by yourself? Some of it, and I'm deeply injured. Physically, it's a part of it. I mean, I have all kinds of injuries right now. My hands are cut up. Uh, I got all kinds of all kinds of bumps and bruises, which I'm not enjoying. And in fact, it scares my wife because I've right. fallen. I've had things. This I have a, a scar right here. This piece of wood for all kinds of things. So that was my first realization. The second realization was if the first one was the house. The second was, I said, baby, it's time for me to acknowledge that Facebook exists because I hate it. I have no interest in it. I've ignored it, shunned it, insulted it, held people who are involved in Facebook in contempt. I can can admit it now. I said, Melly, I am going to find out how I can keep performing for people. Now, there were two reasons for that, Laura, and you know what the two reasons were. One reason is it's my livelihood. I'll f- I, I, if I can figure out some way to perform and bring in money for the family, good. But the other reason is I write songs about peace of mind and trust. You're going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. How am I supposed to deliver the message when I can't get in front of a person to do it? Facebook was the way. Yep. And, it, and it proved to be a miracle cure for 2020 for the Namod family. And I'd like to think, I don't want to presume, I'd like to think for, at this point, many thousands of people who have dropped in for one or 50 mm-hmm. concerts. I've done, I've done probably 150 programs on Facebook, you know, wow. 70 or 80 full length concerts. I keep going online, inviting people to come, and sharing a song or 10, a reading, a lecture about the Tao, an interview with somebody interesting, uh, and a core of people keep coming back. They've become a community unto themselves, and people from all over the world have sent the Namod family a few dollars or more, which is why the mortgage is paid why I can, uh, why when churches are contacting me these days to sing a song or two for their services, they ask me what my fee is. And my answer can be, my fee is whatever you can afford. If you can't Mm -hmm. afford 
anything, then I will record the songs for free. I'm grateful for the invitation. I want to be of service. And that is how I've done this year. And it's going to go down. This is too long an answer. I'm so sorry. I've talked way too much. But, uh, but uh, this year, there are a few achievements in my life. A few, th a few mountains I've climbed, a few things, you know, that I'd like, you know, like I described, no one can take away. You're right. Like, that Jude is nine years old and has never gone hungry. Yeah. And has, right, has never known a day of unsafety, has never, right, that's, that there's, ne that my answer to daddy, can I have more milk, has never been, we can't afford any more milk. That is, a, and I know you know, right, that is a, that is one going to be already one of my greatest achievements as a human that through my music, the fridge has never been empty. And this year, one of my greatest achievements for sure is what I have done. And it's been sincere. I have broken my own heart a thousand times reading people's comments saying, Daniel, and it's not about me at all. Or, Daniel, I have nothing to look forward to except these 12 shows you've done the last 12 nights. No one is visiting me. No one is calling me. My husband is dead and you are showing up every night and smiling into the camera and singing me a song. And it is giving me something to look forward to every single day. Right? Absolutely. Right. And, uh, and now, Daniel, I want to tell you, I can't remember what the congregant's name was, but she was suffering from cancer. And she said she would just listen to your songs over and over ago and her over and over and over and her cancer went away. And she knows it was from just focusing on the words and your music, taking her mind from the cancer to the truth of who she is. And you are an inspiration. I, I, I'm so delighted to hear that. So yeah, it's been it's been profound. I'd never expected it. I never expected to think a good thought about Facebook, honestly. Right. What they've made possible this year has been spectacular. It's been miraculous for the family. I, and, I'm, and I'm keeping on. I've been lighting Hanukkah candles almost every night. I missed two nights in a row. Uh -huh. But the first five nights of Hanukkah, I lit candles with people who wanted to join me. And I sang uh -huh. songs. You know, you know what I mean? It's been special. Yeah. Uh, and I've looked and I would, yeah, your Christmas shows, I would love to come to your studio and, and they were always so inspirational. So what do you have coming up for people if they want? Do you have something coming up, concert or I something? I do. I do. I have, uh, I'm, I've given for, for several years, I've given a, a workshop on New Year's Day oh, that I call, I call Get Ready My Soul, a New okay. Year's Retreat. And it is. I ask questions and I sing songs and I give space to share if you want. And it's going to be 10 to one California time on new year's day. And, okay. and in the past I've had it in person with 60, 70, 80 people here. And in Florida, I did it a couple of years. And this year, what I'm going to do is it's free. I'm going to accept gifts, but I want anybody to come who wants to come, it's free to come. Everything I've done on Facebook is intended as a gift. So I, I, it's not open for registration yet, but it will be um, within the next few days. Okay. And I can't, It's and it has to, you have to register to come because I'm not gonna stream people's sharing on Facebook or you, it won't be recorded and it won't be streamed. So if anybody wants to come, uh, thank you for posting, I see Facebook, uh, go to Daniel Nehemad USA uh, and click follow or uh, check back in. Um, you know, I might, maybe I'll do it as, as early as tomorrow to open up registration okay. uh, so that as many people, that's, that's one thing I'm doing. And the only other regular thing for sure is that every Monday night now for five months, every Monday night has been a concert again for free seven o'clock on, on the same Facebook page, uh, you know, half hour, 40 minutes, super casual, super sweet. It's as much people chatting with each other as it is me singing. Um, it's, a, you know, so seven o'clock on Mondays in California, every Monday night, I've been doing a concert. Um, that's, those are the things I know for sure. And I'm lighting the eighth night of Hanukkah candles tonight at six. On oh. 
And how how's Jude doing with not being in school? Because I know he had just been going a couple years and really was loving it. And how's he doing with that? I, I think about that, that I am so happy my kids are grown and I don't have just because how important it is that connection with other kids. It, it is. It's it's really uh, it's really been hard and sad. Um, every you know, I sometimes tell like a kid who complains about something at any age. Everybody has a complaint about their age. Right. Oh, it's, uh, I'm getting old. Oh, I'm only five. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm only in my 20, whatever it is. Everybody has a complaint about an age. And my response has always been every age has good and every age has hard. Right. Yes. And yeah. the same is true for every grade right now. Um, but yes, in first and second and third, he's in third grade. Um, he wants nothing more than to be around his teacher oh. and then to be around other kids. And um, we have done everything. We, we've been much more liberal than than most people we know in terms of uh, contact with the outside world. We have not. We made the choice a long time ago, months and months ago, that we were going to take a chance, essentially, on catching a virus which uh, uh, could absolutely get us sick. Uh, we realized, but we, but Jude, Jude's mood was really taking a hit. His he had a hard spring when he was sent home from school, and I mean, the, the, one of the saddest things, saddest moments. Uh, that I've seen as a dad was the right. last day, I'm being quiet in case he's listening. He probably isn't. Um, but um, was the last day of second grade. Uh, the teacher said goodbye to all the kids on the screen. Mm -hmm. And he went into his room and laid down on his bed and started crying. Oh, and I, and I came in and I said, what's the matter, buddy? What's, what's, what's the matter? And he said, I didn't even get to say goodbye to my teacher. Right. Oh. Right. So, 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 we sent him to summer camp through the city of Tustin, which they kept going, even though it was very limited and almost no kids came. It didn't matter. He was out of that. We don't have air conditioning in this fixer upper. So he's out of the house in an air conditioned room with cool high school teenagers, counselors, and a couple of kids. Then we sent him to a, you know, an after school program, which only, again, only had a couple kids. Uh, so, and then school is back for only two or three hours a day. It's very inadequate. Educationally, it is a disaster. He is still learning because we don't let a day go by without a substantive conversation about something, science or history or philosophy. We talk about things, but school-wise, it's been really, really hard and sad. And every day he gets back in the car and he says, I wish it was a full day. You know, oh. so he, every day. Thank you for asking. So he's okay. He's, he's lucky. He's got both parents and a fridge, like I said, that's never empty. Um, but it has been very hard. The yeah. isolation, very hard. He's never seen his, he knows his teacher look like, but only from past years, he's never seen his teacher's face. Yeah. Right. Wow. Uh, when a third grader smiles at another third grader, you need to see the face and the, yeah. the aunt, there's no faces, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's hard, hard for everybody, all ages hard. Yeah. Well, let's hope sometime next year that changes, right? It certainly will. It will change. It, yeah, will, it, change. it, it, it will. It will change. And um, it, it's anyway, it's um, I, I do. I, my heart goes out to you and all, oh, you know, all parents that have their kids. I thought there's no way if my kids were in high school that they oh, would be, they'd be partying. They wouldn't be listening. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, you have missing graduation. I mean, I you can't imagine oh, yeah. the things they've missed. Yeah, yeah, the, it's 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 sad. It it is sad. But you know what? I I honor you for, cre you know, that analytical mind of yours, that mind that that your parents instilled in you, um, to really make something of this time. You're being very productive in your home. If you had been traveling this last year with all the concerts, you wouldn't have gotten to do all the stuff. And no. look at, you can look at your house and go, I did that to my ceiling. I, I mean, what, how gratifying that is. Very, and, very right? gratifying. Yeah. 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 And, um, and so you're making that home into your home and you're right. You're in orange County. It's just going up. 
going up in value. Long term, yeah, long term. We're we uh, we want to live here a long time, but uh, but it is an asset. Yes. And for, and again, not to, you know, for a singer songwriter without a hit song, right? A hit song meaning long term revenue. Right. A home is is a retirement fund. A home is is a savings yeah. account. You know. Absolutely. 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 Well, Dave, you know, Daniel, to us, you're a superstar. You are a superstar. Well, and, and, and now that you're just so genuine and so real and your songs so touch so many people's hearts and have had such an impact. And you know what? Thank God you didn't sign with a label. I can't tell you. My son, Corey's always fighting Fine. for artists because they just take their revenue and, and, um, Anyway, yeah. so yeah. Um, good, yeah. good for you for that was a good insight on your part to well, be that. Acc accidental. I would have taken it. I would have taken a deal. Uh, and yes, it would have it would probably have not left me where I am. No. Yeah. Yeah. They would have owned your soul. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, and, and your songs. Yeah. And your songs. Yeah. And those songs are your songs and they're beautiful. Daniel, have a wonderful holiday with your family. It was so great. I'm going to get on. I'm going to be there probably New Year's Day for your concert for sure. I'm going to sign up for that. And I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody who joined us today. Please support Center for Spiritual yes, Living. Please. Yes, please support that. And please, please join Daniel. If you have never been to one of Daniel's concerts or heard him sing, you're missing a lot. If you want your heart open and your soul open, make sure you join um, Daniel and you support his wonderful music and his family and his life. I love you. Love I you love too. you so much. And uh, I can see now that your parents will never put you up for adoption. So I'm just going to have to <laughs> you as a third son vicariously. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Not. That's correct. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us on The Higher View. Thank you, Palm Desert. Bye.